All right, this is the follow-up. And we are following up today on a live video I did on George's Space Chat in 2020. And that was uh, one of the first um, show preparation videos, um, which was um, concerning the show Fun Home. My guest today on the follow-up is none other but the mighty Janine Tesori. Uh, Janine, thank you so much for making yourself available and welcome to the follow-up. You know, George, you call me and I, I'm there. You know that. <laughs> I know you drop everything you, and so says, too. boom. You called me and I was like, what is it? Yes. You know yeah. it's a yes. What is it? Just tell me what. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, of course, the interview is over now. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, George, what was the shortest interview? Well, that would have been a mighty Janine. It was exactly... 18 seconds. <laughs> well, this it's all good. It's all good. Uh, so for those watching, for those listening, let me give you a little bit of background. Mine, as a Janine and mine's background, um, Janine Tesori is the composer of the musical Fun Home, and I was the bass player of the musical Fun Home, both off-Broadway and uh, on the Broadway production. Um, and as is the case with the follow-up series, uh, my intent here is to show a different perspective on a subject that I already talked about uh, on the live videos uh, on George's Space Chat. And um, what the live video was concerned, uh, Fun Home presented, you know, a unique difficulty for me as a bass player because the music seem seemingly was um, quite different. It was all original music and it, 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 it ran the gamut between um, 21st century chamber music and you know modern R&B type um, rhythm section playing. Um, so I was so interested and so curious to hear uh, Janine's take on this, since she has a rather a, a completely unique and uh, yeah unique perspective on what went into the music of Fun Home. So Janine, maybe let me just turn it over to you and. Um, why don't you uh, give us a little bit of, of, of background of how Fun Home got started, and then we can probably get into the musical, the writing of the music uh, of Fun Home. Sure. Uh, Fun Home, uh, uh, let me see. Lisa Crone sent me the graphic novel called Fun Home. Okay. And um, people, I've only generated the story for one musical and that was Violet. And it was when I was still a music director and I was still playing in pits and doing dance arrangements and conducting. And I realized that, you know, if I really wanted to um, get, out of, uh, get out of music directing full time that I, I needed to generate that idea, but it's not my strong suit. And mm. so I've been, gratefully the recipient of a lot of really good ideas and Fun Home was one of them. So Lisa mm. sent me the book. And as soon as I read the graphic novel, I immediately, there's, there's sometimes there's um, with source material there, you develop, I think a spider sense. And mm. it, as soon as I started reading it, I thought, oh, this is a genius idea for a musical and it's going to be quite difficult. Right. And it's um, both of those things. Right. And so we started a long process. It took us five to seven years, somewhere in between there, because the start of a musical is always so bizarre. Yeah. And um, I tend to, I, I don't tend to, I write with playwrights. And uh, I tend to write with people who are doing lyrics for the first time, because I just, I really love the impulses that first time lyricists have, especially when they're playwrights. So they're masters of one form and then they're learning they're transferring the mastery of one and to the humility of an, another and I, I love it a lot of rules get thrown out and I'm, mm. I'm so down for it so that's what happened with fun home that Lisa and I just started this journey together and it, it's you know a graphic novel is almost like a storyboard for a musical so it gave us the visuals and it had the juxtaposition right. of images and text which is so much about what musicals are Right. So you can have something that's quite romantic and then someone is saying, you know, something filled with lemon juice mm -hmm. against and you have both together. So we uh, started from there and did, oh, my God, we were at Sundance four or five times and we did workshops and everything except, you know, puppet shows and yeah, yeah. and and labs, because I really believe in labs. And uh, we were down at the public theater, um, as you know, with you. And then we transferred uptown. 
Oh, excellent, excellent. So, okay, so that gives us you know, at least, you know, a, a sort of a, a timeline of, of how this all came together. Now, speaking from the musical point of view, um, what I tried to explain to the audience in the live video was that here you have a show that seemingly uh, it consists of um, parts that don't necessarily go together. Yet you as the interpreter, as the instrumentalist have to make that, you know, make a cohesive statement out of all of this music, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and through that, you start realizing that, oh, wait a second, the writing is the cohesive statement. Like it, it, it doesn't, you know, you don't necessarily need to interpret too much. You just need to play the music as written. Um, you still have to put your own spin on it. You'd still have to be correct to the period of, of time that's, that's being presented. But the music definitely stands on its own. And now my question to you is, um, is how did how did all these these seemingly you know different styles genres how did all of that make it into fun home like what was your process like um well i you know when i start a piece and i'm in the middle i'm in the end of act one um and just finished another i consider myself an activator mm. So okay. I'm sitting and it's one of the reasons why writing is so hard for me, especially something like an opera. Mm. Um, and I, ch I tend to choose hard subjects because I, I, I really welcome them into the repertoire and I'm not, as, I'm not a commercial writer. I'm a mm. certain kind of writer and I've grown into it. And at the other, on the other end though, I was trained classically from, from the age of three Right. And then I was trained in Nashville from the age of 23. Okay. And, um, and I was a pop player um, at the same time that I did classical music. So I have this incredible love of the basement of music. And when, right. when you know, I'm always, always listening to bass lines. My mentor, Burl, mm. and I would, in any, any music, we would look at what happened when, you know, the, the beauty of a 6-4 inversion and when the bass is so open and then you go to the root or the you know all all of the travel lines especially when we were in nashville and we work with all the studio guys down there mm. we worked with bob moore who was one of the all-time great upright players mm. and we went through bass lines and i could see when when the line would be repeated and you think they wouldn't move and then the downbeat would be left out and it was this huge impact so even today driving in the car for three hours it was all baseline. Mm. I was just listening to the way that, how, how did that, the Lou Reed's baseline and the baseline on the, it's just, I'm, I'm, I, I really, first of all, the frequency booms in the car, mm. but I'm fascinated by that. And, and at the same time, I knew that Fun Home was going to have to be part of the 70s was, an, for me, mm. musically, it was in so much innocence. Mm. that was not um you know there was a trusting sense of growing up as a kid in the 70s and um, and a lot of families singing and a lot of belief in a system that didn't wasn't true at all right and so to me it's a version of the 50s but you've gone through the 60s so it's it's different and musically this incredible incredibly rich period which is one of my favorites so i knew that i wanted to have a, a deep rhythm section and that's why I love working with John Clancy because I right. do not like trap kits I think they tend to sound really crappy okay on um, Broadway shows I think they're really hard to mic and you're constantly switching drummers and we had the most beautiful band but you also have to make room for subs right. and you have to so I really like made up kits that are made of a djembe or a cajon mm. and they were a lie so you're constantly looking at the what's holding the the groove together on the other hand i knew that fun home was going to have to be musically filled with gestures the way that memory snakes around and that chamber and the english horn and that yeah, 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 yeah. movement that was going to be melodic and not block harmony that was going to be moving yeah. and the two coming together was really interesting to me because in that house like the house i grew up it was, there were a, there was a lot of rock music. There was a lot of pop music and R&B, church and classical music. And when you put them all together, one mm. person's listening to this and one person is practicing, 
you know, you you have a counterpoint. Yeah. Um, you can understand it. I was deeply, deeply interested in all of those things. Mm, that is that is so deep. That is that is so and and inc incredibly descriptive uh, on uh, at the same time. Now, a couple things you said right there that that I want to zero in on, and that is number one, the seventies. Um, I remember doing a show with you uh, for um, for encores. For encores, exactly. For yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm getting my act together and taking yeah. taking it on the road or whatever. Um, which uh, again was set in the '70s. Um, yeah. And and I remember the the talk you you gave, you know, to the cast, um, trying to get them into the '70s. And perhaps you can sort of give us um, a, an abbreviated version of that, basically. Like, what did the '70s look like to you? Um, cause it's totally understandable that, you know, the seventies looked quite differently from, for a lot of people. Right. But what did they look like to you and how did that perhaps influence or how did that sort of, how did that make, what made it, what made it into fun home and, you know, from that memory? Well, for me, the the seventies for me were a couple of things. I had seen when I was really young. I'd seen Karen Carpenter do a drum solo, and oh, it was wow. before the world ruined her. Right. She was such a deep drum drummer. She was right. deep, yeah. and there she was in her yarn, crazy, her bangs and her thing. And I saw this chick behind a <laughs> behind a kit, and I had never seen her before. Mm. Um, so the 70s to me were informed by this precipice of the singer songwriter. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's the first time that I had really heard. Well, I was I was obsessed with Stevie Wonder. So I was analyzing him in my head. I was obsessed with Cat Stevens because oh, he was wow. one of the few. Cat Stevens was one of the few people. Well, not few, but in my world, who really did equal amounts guitar mm. and keyboard. And he had crazy harmonic changes, like in the middle of phrases and mixed phrases. Um, Dave Brubeck was really, mm. when he's all of the mixed meter that he was le learning, like um, when he was the, the Turkish music that, you know, all I knew, this is, I was so young, and all I knew was the way it felt. It was, the, it was that kind of off kilter stuff. And then you put that against the Beatles and all of this stuff. And so I was from a really early age, my piano teacher and I had him when I was really young, we did everything because I was obsessed with rhythm. Right. You know, I was obsessed, obsessed with rhythm, but I also really loved Mozart and I loved Kavaleski and, um, and Beethoven and especially mm. Bartok, oh, um, wow. Stravinsky. So I, it was a, a lot of, um, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't really into romantic, my, one of my teachers, once it got serious, wanted me to play um, Chopin, and and all of a sudden I was like, "Hell no! Mm. Look at this. This is mm. not a Chopin player. Like I don't, I don't, I don't have that in me. It's a different, it's a different kind of romantic long line." Right. So uh, you know that that idea for me in the '70s was there were a couple of things. It was the singer songwriter. And it was the, the rise of the singing family. So for Fun Home, you know, the Partridge family, the Cowsills, the King family, the Osmonds, the Jackson Five. Oh. And it, it grew to inflate this fakety fake fake vision until the Loud family happened and Watergate happened. It was perpetuating the way that American families were growing up, which had nothing to do with the truth. Oh, wow. So, all of us wanted straight hair like Lori Partridge and I wanted to be, you know, the, the Jackson Five's little sister mm. and all, all of that, you know, it was just, it was, that was AstroTurf. It was nothing, but we bought it. Right. We bought it hook, line and sinker. So that also came into Fun Home in a very deep way, plus classical music because Helen was, a, a, the character in Fun Home was a deeply good classical pianist right right so right right, right. mix all of those things and not make a mess yeah 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 yeah, yeah. no most definitely that, that you know that makes a lot of sense um i think that that um the whole uh premise of um living a lie you know that definitely came through with fun home um 
like what is the lie okay well the lie is that you know we all need to have the straight hair you know we all want to be like partridge family we all want to be that quote unquote normal right whatever that's supposed to mean like not realizing that normal doesn't really exist perhaps yeah you know right. um so that that made a lot of sense to me and and i think that um what what was interesting and this is just again sharing now my perspective what was interesting trying to to interpret all of that was once again finding to the cohesive statement throughout all of this right and for me that meant going back to the story right you had you had to have you had to have the music almost be programmatic because there were certain themes that needed to come up at the right time when a character was on stage um let me ask you about this thematic writing um is that something that that you actively pursue um was it something that that you know you you tried to get into fun home or was it something that that happened in the confines of fun home uh, well i it's such a good question i think dramatic for me i'm a i'm a dramatic writer no, not and, dra not dramatic but thematic having a theme right, but, oh okay but, okay okay but as a dramatic it's interesting yeah, yeah. that they sort of rhyme Yeah. dramatic and thematic go yeah. together yeah, yeah. it's one of the reasons why aab or any sonata form to me yeah. works because you state something you state an a right and then you go you develop it no matter what aab or recapitulation in a sonata form when you come back to that theme you are different Right. You are different because you have journeyed somewhere else. Mm. You have all done it together. Yeah. And that's the difference between dramatic writing for me is that an audience comes in at 8.06 yeah. and, and they are 8.10, <laughs> depending on your cast. And, and you, you, you listen together to something. If you don't have a cast recording, you've never heard before. So right. when it comes back and it's thematic theme and variations right you're taking something based on the collective memory of the audience and they're saying wait i heard that before where did i hear that oh he sang that right. he sang that before yeah. so when for instance and i when i teach I, i i talk so much about reprises first of all second acts in so many ways are so much easier in a sense because you've You've taught the audience how to listen to your piece. Mm. And now you've got to bring some things back. So you're not, one of my mentors would say, stop inventing and start developing. Right. And right. the idea that you are taking something and you're doing it this way and that way, so that when you bring it back, it has this punch. Right. We do it with um, when Helen... Uh, and she's she's playing the piano exercises at the piano and she stands up when she senses that her husband is screwing around and she says, maybe not right now. And she goes back and that is going to be the song right. that that her daughter, you know, kids by osmosis know everything. They know the song of the parents. They sing the song of the parents. There are the variation genetically, right. musically, you know, psychologically of their parents. Right. So we, it is part of the condition of being alive. And she sings it, you know, when she wants to make a choice of her own to be herself. Right. And you watch her sit back down. Remember when her father says, go put on, you know, and she says, maybe not right now when she's right. going to change into right. what she wants to wear. So that's what I mean by the drama and theme and variations to me are in, intrinsically tied. Oh, that is incredible. That is incredible. And I, I would not have, you know, I would not have thought of it that way at all. Um, I, I certainly enjoyed the seeing the um, reaction of the audience because we, we were, vis as the musicians, we were visible. Um, and I couldn't help but imagining at least that um, Certain themes definitely, you know, I I saw I sort of saw the the light bulbs went go off, right? Um, which was an incredible experience to have, you know, especially at Circle in the Square. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that that answers so many questions <laughs> in a lot of ways. I mean, that's that's just what it is, you know. Um, the perhaps lastly. Um, what's what's the life past 
fun home has what has that been like musically right what has that been is there is there some sort of has that changed your writing style has it influenced your writing style has it um you know has what what has the outcome of fun home been for you as a composer oh another great question you know it tied in with um fun home is when i i started writing serious operas and i'm right. in the middle of one i think it's going to be my final one and uh, another musical, but starting with Caroline or Change, Fun Home. I, there, and it's interesting that you have this perspective of being this uh, virtuoso, but but interpretive in a sense, mm. in 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 that way that you're you're you have a point of view right. that's coming at a show to me, which I really love. And. Carolina Change was the first time where I thought, oh, this is how I write. Right. This is how I write. This is how it just takes a while. You, 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 I feel like one learns how to write by writing. Right. And no one pays you how to write. No one teaches you how to write because you can sort of learn, I think, but not really. You write by writing and seeing what works and then bringing it back into your little lab and yeah. going back out. And, and theater writing is a public form. Mm. You don't really have a show unless you have people in seats. You can have a cost recording, but it's not the same thing. Mm. And so I have been, gratefully been a lot of opportunities to try things out and, and figure out how to, why should, first of all, why should I be writing this? That's a big thing that I ask. Am I the right writer for this? Is it, is it a story that I would want to see? Is it a story that I'd want my daughter to know about in that way? Let me um, let me just ask you real quick. Sorry to interrupt you, but is that yeah. something that that is that your process overall? Has that your process been? You know, has this been your process overall, or is this kind of new to your process after Fun Home? No, that started that started um, right away when I wrote Violet. I, mm. you know, the shows that I write are very diverse, mm. and I tend to go towards protagonists that have been invisible you mm. know there's never been a butch mm. lesbian as a protagonist in a musical right. before right um and and i and writing that with lisa crone was really important or caroline or change or violet or the opera blue or right. the new opera grounded which is about a female drone pilot and uh, because there have been mostly men and mostly white men writing um, dramatic work un until the, the, I would say the last 20 years, they've been really amplified more. Mm. You, we've had a lot of sons stories and not a lot of daughter stories. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that's that's the other thing I noticed with with Fun Home. The one of the reason it changed was I was able to release a lot of my own experiences being the daughter of a complicated educated father mm. and when lisa and i were looking around because we always think okay look at the masters and there are many beautiful shows out there mm. many beautiful pieces of, of work you want to look at it and wonder how they did that how are you going to do your version of that without without mimicking it but wh what's your version of that and there just were not a lot of daughter stories out there, not a, not daughter father stories. That's and I deep. thought, oh, that's because a lot, not a lot of daughters have been able to get their work to this point. The great thing about age is, and I think it's why Allison also waited so long to write it. She wanted her ambition to meet her skill. Mm. It takes a while to know what you're doing. I just now, I think with Fun Home, also feel more in control of the craft. Mm. than I have because com composition to me is so much about tension and release mm. and knowing the audience just has to have a cigarette break they're like don't make them think they just need to laugh and enjoy the hors d'oeuvre tray yes. now bring them back and I learned a lot of that from George C. Wolfe you know yeah. you're 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 in a dance with an audience and yeah. so that is it's it's hard to guess and then you make it public and then you fall on your face or you don't Right, 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 right. Most definitely. Now, this, that there was the what I always loved about Fun Home was the the sort of universal appeal, right? And mm -hmm. and and again, I'm bringing it back to the idea of living a lie, right? Which Bechtel Senior was doing, right? And and it affected him obviously, but it also, even though he tried to keep it together, keep it together, 
it affected everyone or you know in his inner circle right in mm -hmm. his immediate family um and i thought that um and of, of course i you know partially uh, partially directly partially indirectly but uh, i couldn't help it but comparing it to shows that i had previously done spring awakening memphis all of those you know original music shows um that's that all of them tell these stories that have universal parts in it that you know people in the audience can well this was not my family but we also lived a lie right mm -hmm. you know in my family it was the the various other families that my father had you know it, it was not the the whole different sexuality that was not the case but there was like several other versions of us in every city where he stayed for a minute right um so all of that, these universal themes, right, sort of t spoke to the audience, right? Spring Awakening, it was, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, you know, coming of age, basically, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. puberty, right? Mm -hmm. um, with Memphis, it, it was the universal theme was, I think, more racially um, poignant than than the show had been given credit for right? agreed yeah. right and that was that was sort of the 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 cultural influence of black america into white america and then the mayhem that results from that right nevertheless the audience understood it and that was that was the interest an interesting thing because memphis was you know ran for three years with a yeah. solid audience and solid fa fan base right um so these universal themes speak to a lot of people and, and sort of get the audience to see themselves in the show. Was that something that, that you thought um, was represented well enough with the production of, of, of Fun Home? Was it, was it something that you, know, that you were aware of? Well, you really um, brought those, you know, again, it's the beauty of having um, someone in your position um, exalted you know as as a musician and and also on on the side of it underneath it because it's such an you you can see get all of this collective wisdom from the shows that you're that you're doing definitely with fun home I think about um, you know universality about what it's like to be on the planet to me is uh, an incredibly powerful thing because I do think it's transformational. And I think it's transformational in a, in a way that is um, substantive, that really promotes long-term change. I saw yeah. long-term change, and I've seen it from, some, from certain shows. There are many, many, many great shows out there. There are not many shows that transform the culture that enter in at the moment what's required. Hamilton obviously is one, Chorus Line was one, West Side Story was one because it came out of the papers. It came out of what it was like to, be, to walk on the earth at that moment. And Fun Home, the, one of the reasons why it was such a great idea was that, I don't know if you remember the matinee where the Supreme Court passed the marriage equality oh, was yeah. one of our matinees. Yeah. Um, you, you know, uh, Samantha Powers brought uh, ambassadors, some of whom whose yes. countries homosexuality was illegal. Right. And then we discussed it afterwards about how, you know, I think the adage of, of, of theater can change something. Well, it's based on truth. It really right. can, because there is, when we talk about being able to see ourselves, sometimes it's, it's not a, what I call it, not metaphorical, not metaphor based. It's like seeing, oh, in, in Memphis and you see white America and black America mm. and, and, and what, who, who took what, who got yeah. credit for what, who all of that, where that tension came from. And you watch it play out in yeah. two and a half hours and you are there with them, you are yeah. with them. And then in something like Fun Home, uh, I think there is this, this, for me, this is idea of many, many things at once, which, which was, you know, when, when you betray your parents, which I think you kind of are supposed to do, my mm -hmm. daughter is supposed to do better than mm -hmm. I from learning from my mistakes. Allison's father killed himself at the age of 43. Mm -hmm. At the age of 43, what is she going to do? 
it's not just about killing herself, but is she going to be weighed down? That's really the animating question. I'm 43 and stuck. Am I just like you? I'm just like you. You know, it's this idea of your the people who made you. Mm. He was in the 50s as a gay man. He never had a shot. He totally had a shot. Both are true. Yeah. She was a Title IX, you know, at the time of the 70s, where by the time 79 came around and she was at Oberlin, she had a shot. There was right. something called the Gay Students Union. Right. So, and then you look to queer culture now and you, and you see it's just that, that the people who have pushed the story down at great sacrifice. So there's that thing. There is also the idea of that we are always, I think, coming out. And when my mother um, saw Fun Home, and my mother is 90 and she was raised in a convent. Mm. And, and she's very open, but raised in a convent um, in, a, in, a, uh, in Pennsylvania. Mm. And she, at the end when I saw her and I thought, it wasn't that I thought she was gonna be upset. My mother is so open. And she said, God, I guess we're always coming out, right? Mm. To just try to find out who we truly are at any age. And that understanding of, you know, big ways and small ways of who we are and that ongoing question, yeah. the declaration of self to me was all the way through, all the way through, um, you know, the ring of keys moment, which some people have sexualized, but it's not that it's, it's really about seeing something and thinking, oh, there it is. Right. That, and, you know, a Marine afterwards was saying he remembered that moment for him and he was straight, straight man saying he saw someone in uniform and he thought there i am right um and so it's this affirmation that you simply aren't walking on the earth alone that yeah. you have seen someone else's story and then you leave the theater feeling a, a, ever so slightly or greatly transformed yeah. and that changes yeah, yeah yeah most definitely most definitely well listen janine tesori i i cannot thank you enough for today this this was a fantastic conversation i'm so glad that that you know you made yourself available and that we had this time together um you know this this was definitely i always i i, I and i think i'm pretty sure I, I i talked about this in the live video that fun home was a hard show to play you know that yeah. was it was a really it, it was just a difficult show to play. There were technicalities, you know, for the bass players, you had to play five basses. For guitar players, you had to play six guitars, you know, all these multiple instruments. But aside from that, there was the authenticity that had to be conveyed in at sometimes, you know, 10 seconds spurts. Like, yeah. For a very short time, this needs to sound exactly like this, right? And then, yeah. you know, you have like a, a minute and a half of it needing to sound like exactly something else, but super authentically, right? Um, yeah. So I try to to convey to the audience that that there is, you know, a lot of joy in 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 working on this on original music number one and that there's more to it than just reading the notes on the paper oh because i mean you know that you music... know you're there when before the paint is dry yeah that's the fun of it yeah. because once you get cold on a show like could i write something for fun home now absolutely not i'm not who i was mm. no i'm not i i can't even i'm not in that space but you are there we are all there when the paint is not dry yeah and what you said reminds me that that's the way me to me that memory works. Memory is not convenient. Yeah. Memory comes up and swamps you from behind at just at a time. And it doesn't stay until it, at, it stays as long as it stays and then it leaves, right. which partially determines the form by the right. content yeah. of the way that memory works. Right. I can see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was, you know, it, it the way it, it translated itself to me, was like, okay, I needed to, as I said before, in these 10 seconds here, in these, f whatever, however many measures there were, right? I need to sound like this recording, right? Because it's, mm -hmm. it totally reminds me of this recording. Okay, so I need to sound like that. And then I need to switch right away into another mode, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that I am doing all of this and that I have the, memory to use that word um 
that lets me, you know, grab into, you know, this bag and that bag and make it, make that authentic statement. That is the continuing thread through it, right? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, you don't need to look for anything else. The fact that you're doing it already is already enough, right? Um, so that I thought, you know, I tried to convey to the audience, it was a, it was a hard show to play and it, it took me a minute to get into it. Um, simply because I had to open myself up to it, you know, and, and, and figure out, okay, well, how am I going to interpret this, this piece of music? Um, interesting thing was, I think also was that there was only one act. Um, cause that yes. always, that changes the dynamic, um, at least from a musician's point of view, from an instrumentalist's point of view. Um, and it changes how you, how you use your energy. Right. Let yeah. me put it this way: like, how how do you divide your your focus? Like, when do you come out of it? When when do you stay in it? You know, when do you kind of dip a little bit, or when do you take a breather? Because you need to do that as well. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so having the whole thing as one act made a huge difference, mm -hmm. in my opinion, right? Um, because you kind of had a feeling of okay, well, strap in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know once it starts it it won't stop you know mm -hmm. until until we're at the end of the story and we've all had this incredibly emotional um moment together right mm -hmm. um so all of that to say that you know what a joy it was to work on it it was it was really um it was it was a great show it was i i, I thoroughly enjoyed it um and i, I well really, george you know, you know you're always my first call at oh. any time like oh, no it's absolutely <laughs> true chris fennick knows that it's like because you are i know if you and i think that people don't understand this and i you know if you are only as strong as the most authentic person who is uh, above every theater is theater in the round mm. even if you're not theater in the round right. you can feel it is an audience maybe not intellectually but you right. can feel that yeah. And part of that is I, I, where I can, I've started really doing my best to advocate for players to be seen because you listen differently. Mm. And especially if young people, they're seeing people play, they're saying, what is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What instrument is that? How do you play it? What, yeah. it, all, all of those things going on, you listen differently. And I know that you're going to be asking questions and you're going to be collaborating in a way that people use. You just said the least of it is reading the notes. Yeah. The yeah, least yeah, yeah. of it yeah. is I'm, reading the notes. It's a, it's a necessity because it's a mode of, of communication. You yeah. know, that's, that's what it is. Uh, but it, 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 music doesn't, music starts if you go past the, the, the paper, you know, that's, yeah. that's just no two ways about that. And uh, it's funny. You know, I get I get asked that a lot coming from Vienna, you know, about reading and all of that. In Vienna, the definition of reading is if you only read what's on the paper, like people will laugh at you. That's yeah. there, there is no like if you don't interpret, you're not doing it. Period. End of story. It's yeah. that's that's just what it is. You know, it's you can and you can be quick about the reading part and 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 have a great skill level. But if you don't interpret what's written, you're not doing your job. And that's, you know, a fundamental base. Uh, yeah. And it's, I'm not, I'm not using that as like B-A-S-S, -S, like B-A-S-E uh, yeah. for, for, no, it's you know, for being an, in, exactly yeah. a foundation for, for being an instrumentalist, you know. But so, I think for people watching this, that that is a very important to the authenticity. Look, I also think it's really scary, no matter who you are, to um, be vulnerable, to play vulnerably, to yeah. not to make it more than is, is music math. Of course it is. It's intervallic. Yeah. It's rhythm. It's fractions. It's all those things. But oh, my God, the most of it is the mystery of it. Right. The most of it is really daring to put something down and 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 not and not know. Right. And I think the more that we cultivate and show other players, especially from, you know, bass players, to me, there's there's always this super hyper masculine, all, all of that stuff. And to really be able to put your heart out on on the sleeve, along with laying down the foundation and finding right. the pocket, you know, that that's that to me is where it is. That's why I stay in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, most definitely. All right. Well, listen, Janine, I don't want to take up more of your time. I really appreciate you being here today. Um, you know, stay safe. Uh, we are in the process of reopening up or whatever, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Um, um, and, um, you know, hopefully it's a reprise. It's a reprise. Yeah, <laughs> most definitely. Back, we're different. Ron Carter calls it the, the, the long intermission. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> is, right. This is, is a good way of putting it. You know, I mean, yeah. not taking anything away, but that is a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, Agreed. So, you know, hopefully we'll run into each other in Midtown and, um, you know, stay safe out there. And um, thanks again for being here today. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. Take care now.